Eminences, Excellencies, Members of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great honor and a privilege to address you today on the matter of the family in this August venue. The title of my lecture this afternoon is Love and Work in the Great Migrations of the 21st Century. Anthropologically, migrations are written in our genome and encoded in our bodies, in our bipedalism, in our stereoscopic vision, in our central nervous system. Modern humans are the children of immigration. Migrations elude simplistic, mechanistic models of causality because they unfold in complex ecologies involving economy and society, cultural practices, and historic relationship. War and terror and unchecked climate change remain wicked drivers of involuntary forced migrations, a topic I am happy to entertain in the discussion but will not address directly in my brief remarks this afternoon. Global migrations are transforming the shape of families the world over. At the proximate level, migration is a household matter. Distinct patterns of kinship and social organization carve the pathways for worldwide migratory journeys. The unit of migration is the family, variously defined and structured by diverse culturally coded legislative, economic, reproductive, religious, and symbolic forms. At the distal level, migration is multiply determined by labor markets, demographic imbalances, wage differentials, technologic change, and the environment. On the ground, however, it is the family that makes migration work. Migration is an ethical act of and for the family. The broad features of large-scale migration over the last four generations can be divided into three distinct chapters. The rise of labor migration, which begat family reunification, which begat the rise of the immigrant second generation. During the war and post-war era, there were concentrated efforts to bring temporary guest workers into the high-income countries of Europe and North America, elsewhere as well. Industry and agriculture found much-needed field hands, and for immigrants, family remittances became the central motivation for transnational migration. In the United States, a country that has approximately four times more migrants than the second largest country of immigration, to give you a sense of perspective, in the US, a war effort program was created in 1942 by executive order. It was called the Mexican Farm Labor Program. This so-called Bracero program, guest worker, slowly generated momentum and over time became the largest migration flow in the history of the United States. Again, the country with approximately four times more migrants than the second largest country of immigration. In due time, as migrant workers settled, the rise of family reunification gave kinetic momentum to new migratory flows. Many other high-income countries around the world saw very similar, if not isomorphic, dynamics. High-income countries the world over came to discover 
a fundamental law of migration. There is nothing more permanent than temporary guest worker programs. Today, it is the rise of the second generation, the children of immigrants, the elephant in the demographic, the demographic elephant in the room that has come to define the immigration landscape in much of the high income world. Immigration typically starts with the family, and family bonds sustain it. Love and work, love and work. Freud's pithy words on the well-lived life are useful to think about migration as an adaptation of and for the family. It is initiated by the family, and the family is deeply transformed by immigration. One family starts my, the migration process, and another family, entirely reconstituted, completes it several generations later. Familyhood is increasingly experienced by hundreds of millions of migrants as a long distance transnationalism of the heart. According to the most recent United Nations data, data that uh, Professor Dumont shared with us uh, earlier, international migrants worldwide reached 281 million. It's probably an undercount. In 2020, up from 220 million in 2010 and 173 million in 2000. The percentage of migrants in the global population increase significantly from 2.8% of the global population in 2000 to 3.6% in uh, the present. In 2020, two thirds of all international migrants were living in just 10 countries. The majority uh, of international migrants uh, were living in the United States. Over 50 million migrants in the United States today. That's all of Spain plus, let's say, 10% of Italy. That's the migrant population of the United States. In order to uh, imagine the economic impact, the Hispanic, which is by far the largest migration in the United States now, GDP is approximately $2.7 trillion. That would be the, uh, Jeff can help me, I think that would be the seventh largest economy in the world. Today, the largest corridors of international migration are in the Americas, Asia, and Europe. Immigration literally unsettles the family. For millions, migrations begin tentatively as target-earning sojourns with a plan of eventually returning home. Yet, our longitudinal data set and many other studies since we uh, first developed um, this uh, data set, uh, reveal that most migrations today result in protracted family separations. Research shows that separations threaten the cohesion of the family, transforming well-established roles, creating new loyalties, and destabilizing cultural skips of authority, reciprocity, and responsibility. In this paper, my co-author Carola Suarez Orozco and I locate the family at the center of global migrant journeys. We review the main features of transnational familyhood and its implications for the meaning of family life in an age of mass migrations. We consider what it means to be a parent, a child, a family unit in transnational contexts. We examine the reverberations of transnational family separation. We briefly consider the context of family reunifications and ask how the legislative, reproductive, social, and symbolic functions of the family are reestablished after long-term separation. Finally, 
we reflect very briefly on policies qua migration and the family in the contemporary order. Across a wide array of immigrant communities, disparate cultural norms place the parent-child nucleus at the structural, emotional, and economic center of the family. Yet the lived realities of migration create new patterns of caretaking, which both expand and transform the definition of the family. Migrations create extended family separations, which result in biological parents providing long distance financial supports, while the caretakers, often extended or fictive kin, provide the daily experience near care of the children left behind. Extended separations lead to complex attachments to both the new caretakers and the biological parents, who often become, for the children, abstractions over time. Reunifications, when they happen, lead to complex and poignant adjustments for all parties in the caretaking system. Long distance familyhood complicate the integrative family paradigm center on the conceptual mother, father, children, normative ideal. For a decade, Professor Carola Suarez Orozco and I directed the Harvard Immigration Project, a US-based, multi-sided, longitudinal, interdisciplinary, bicoastal study with a recently arrived 400 recently arrived immigrant youth, ages four, nine, nine to 14, and their families from China, the Dominican Republic, various nations in Central America, including El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, as well as the Caribbean, Haiti, and of course, Mexico. We found the majority of children had been separated from one of both parents for protracted periods of time, from six months to 10 years. Nearly three quarters of the youth were separated from both parents during the migration process. We found significant differences between groups. Chinese families were the least likely to be separated over the course of migration, only 52%, while the vast majority of Central Americans, now all countries combined, 88%, and Haitian children, 85%, were separated from one or both parents during the course of migration. The length of separations from parents was unexpectedly long, with some children enduring separations from one or both parents for nearly their entire childhood. The length of separations varied widely across countries of origin. The youth who were separated, of the youth that were separated from their mothers, Central American children endure separations lasting four years or more, as did approximately one third of both the Dominican and Haitian children. Chinese and Mexican children underwent fewer and shorter separations from their mothers. Separations from their father, from fathers tended to be very lengthy or permanent. What are the effects of such separations? When compared, comparing youth who had not undergone family separations with youth that, who had, we found that arriving as a family unit uh, revealed over time less evidence of symptoms of the so-called mood disorders, including uh, dysthymia, uh, depression, uh, and anxiety. The data revealed as measured by uh, standard culturally relative uh, scales of anxiety and depression. The data reveal high levels of psychological distress measured by depression and anxiety scales among youth who had undergone lengthy family separation. Youth who had undergone separations of four or more years from their mothers reported the greatest distress. Furthermore, we learned that two caretaker systems for youth left behind had afforded more stable care as well as better extended support for the children. 
for immigrant parents, here's the first generational asymmetry. For immigrant parents, the absent child remains a daily sustaining presence. For children, however, the story is entirely different. Over time, as the rhythms and rituals that punctuate child and adolescent development unfold, birthdays, First Holy Communion, Confirmation, quinceañeras, and the like, the day-to-day -day caretakers took on the parental function at a symbolic level. Over time, most children develop two sets of parents, one vividly present and one ambiguously present. Family reunifications. After many sacrifices, family reunification should be a joy joyful and momentous. Yet the, re the reunification phase, we found, was quite complicated. For the parents, reunion signified the conclusion of a painful period of sacrifice and struggle to bring the family together. For the children, however, the reunification was the beginning of a new and emotionally complex phase. Immigrant children are twice migrant. They migrate to a new country, and they migrate to a new family. Also, as they now the children enter a new cycle of mourning. They mourn the caretakers they left behind. As uh, Rebecca and Leon uh, Gr Grimberg uh, wrote in a beautiful book, uh, migrants, and especially children, are perpetual mourners. They're always mourning some loss behind. Upon reunification, youth displayed a range of emotions, from culture shock to anger, sadness, grief, and depression. For some, the extended separations led to a sustained rejection of the parent they came to experience psychosocially as having abandoned them. In such cases, the damage of a long absence led to rifts, cha very challenged to transverse. Some youth were unforgiving, and by the time parents re-entered their lives, the youth had grown accustomed to living without them. They were ready to assert in greater independence and were unwilling to submit to the parents' authority after extended periods of separation. Some parents perceived the socio-emotional ruptures and patiently worked to rebuild a bridge across a socio-emotional chasm. The mother of a 14-year-old Honduran boy told us, quote, it was really hard at the beginning because we have been separated for five years. He barely knew me. By now, little by little, we are rebuilding something." End of quote. Other parents were less patient. A Haitian father, who had worked years to bring his daughter, said between clenched teeth, quote, she barely looks at me. All she does is complain that she wants to go back to her aunt in Port-au-Prince. And she treats me like a bank ATM. I think many of us who are parents have experienced a little bit of that. Parents and adolescents share with us that the reunifications were especially complicated when youth had to adapt to entirely reconstituted families. New spouses, new siblings born in the new society, and um, the arrival of new or step siblings. The mother of a 13-year-old Nicaraguan child said, quote, we are now getting used to each other. We, were, um, we uh, are both beginning a different life together. The kids, her children, some born in the US, some reunited later, are jealous of each other. And my husband, there is the problem of men, my husband is jealous of all of them. Jealousy exists between those who were born in the US and those who were not, end of quote. The moment of reunification was thus interlaced with contradictory emotions, 
as children had to leave lifelong caretakers behind. For many children, this commenced a new circle of mourning. Making ends meet, there are further complications now that flow from the parents, who are now, after long separations, physically present, but may continue to be only ambiguously there for the children. Making ends meet while learning a new language and the ways of a new culture to raise children drains many parents of time and energy. The cumulative stresses and losses of migration, while tempered by economic gains, leave many, many parents emotionally exhausted, anxious, depressed, and distracted. They may be physically present, but psychosocially, they're elsewhere, unable to meet the new needs of new siblings reunited with them. Immigration is particularly stressful when parents are unable to draw on their usual resources and coping skills. Immigration removes many parents from the supports that are linked to community ties, jobs, and the main institutions of the new society. Strip of many of their significant supports, extensive kin, fictive kin, friends, neighbors, immigrant parents may never fully develop the social maps needed to find their way in a foreign land. I need to uh, also uh, now interject that the, um, the immigrants in the United States, uh, Western Europe, are highly segregated, deeply segregated. Latino children now are the most segregated children in the United States, predicting we did, this was longitudinal data, so we were able to predict what gets you, for example, to learn English better, or to get into college. We found that having one friend, one friend who is a native English speaker, was a best predictor of their transition and long-term academic adaptation, only because they're so deeply segregated that they might as well be in, on the moon when it comes to the daily transactions in American society. The parents, are, are unable in many ways to, uh, 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 here is then uh, the great paradox. They become more empowered economically, yet many experience a keen sense of inadequacy in their ability to exercise parental authority. <clears throat> At a time when immigrant children and youth, especially during the adolescent years, need guidance in navigated, navigating difficult cultural currents in the new country, many parents find themselves at a loss in guiding the children. Further, a loss of parental status is um, amplified by multiple social emotions parents experience as immigrants in the new society. The sources of these emotions are many, and the consequences are profound. Some start with taking jobs beneath their qualifications and skills. The field of immigration is littered with examples of wasted talent. The doctor from China, now working as a nurse. The nurse from El Salvador, now working as a cleaning lady. The engineer from Ghana, now working as a taxi driver in New York City. Even with a better salary, these social emotions are a very hard pillow, is, um, pill to swallow. A Mexican immigrant remembers in a beautiful uh, biography uh, written about growing up as a Mexican child in Los Angeles, quote, nothing broke my father except the U.S. He couldn't find his footing here. here. He could not rise again, and he knew it. He tried many jobs, bus boy, cannery worker, bakery truck driver, but nothing worked. Demoralization, uncertainty, and stress are at work but uh, part of the strain that warms its way into the heart of the immigrant family is the stress of marginality. Immigration reverses the natural order of parental authority. In a new society, the rules of engagement change, and immigrant parents are no longer masters of the game. For immigrant parents, relinquishing the parental function is a painful and reluctant process. Some do so out of a sense of helplessness, and entrust their children prematurely with responsibilities beyond their years. Some youth cherish this 
role as responsible, if parentify, members of the family. Others, however, felt burden and were left with a warm that undermines basic certitude. Eva Hoffman, in a beautiful novel, autobiographical, writes that her par Polish parents did not, quote, no, even try to exercise much influence over me. In Poland, her mother said, I would know how to bring you up. I would have known what to do. But here, she had lost her sureness. She had lost her authority, end of quote. Parents find themselves turning to their children for uh, help, guidance in the practical, cultural, and linguistic innocence of the new society. As they take new responsibilities, a reversal begins. The children become culturally the authority figures in the new family. Under the best of circumstances, immigration represents a, a significant challenge for a newly reconstituted family. As we have detailed, the very shape of the family, as well as the dynamics be between its members, are forever changed. Dysfunctional immigration policies compound these challenges, imposing unnecessary burdens to the immigrant family. One minute. The status quo, certainly in the United States, is uh, dystopic and in need of repair. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, family reunification as a conceptual center of uh, its immigration uh, policy. Yet the bureaucratic undertow preventing the transition of new families in a timely manner create extraordinary time, lengthy separations. Finally, the children of immigrants today are the smallest actors in the global stage. They are the fastest growing sector of the child population in a number of high income countries. 40% of the children that got up this morning in Berlin to go to schools come from non-German immigrant and refugee origin home. In Rotterdam, uh, The Hague, and Amsterdam, Two-thirds of the children that woke up this morning to go to schools come from non-Dutch immigrant origin homes. In New York, over half the children come from immigrant and refugee origin homes. In Los Angeles, 70% of the children come from refugee and immigrant homes. At a time when the only sector of the US demographic in the child population growing is the immigrant origin sector, the journeys of children are sure to reshape the future character of a number of a growing number of countries the world over. The future, their future, is our future. Thank you so much.